Welcome to season five of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore, Maryland. Our goal with this podcast is to bring scientific evidence and experience to shed light on critical health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. One million deaths from COVID-19. Today, our guest is Dr. Sandro Galea, Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. Dr. Galea speaks with Dr. Sharfstein about how we got here and what the future might hold. His new book is The Contagion Next Time. Let's listen. Sandro Galea, thank you so much for joining me in Public Health On Call. I've just had the great experience of reading your new book, The Contagion Next Time. And it's a powerful exploration of the pandemic and a lot more. And it hit me hard as the country is approaching 1 million deaths. So welcome. And I wonder if you could talk about what that milestone means to you. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Thank you for having me. You know, 1 million deaths is a tragedy, right? It's actually very hard to wrap our brain around a million deaths as human. It's um, one of the headlines from uh, the New York Times that uh, I use in my presentations was from uh, May 25th, 2020. And the New York Times had in its all caps, bold, 100,000 deaths and incalculable loss. This is when we reached 100,000, when at the time, nobody really was saying the number a million, two million. So a million people is a tragedy. It's a million you know, friends, parents, grandmothers, lovers, aunts, cousins. And I think it's important that we remember that. And being at this point, for me, pushes us to ask, what should we be learning from this moment? You know, nothing redeems the tragedy, but certainly the tragedy is made worse if we don't learn from the moment. So I found myself in quite a bit of my writing and public engagement lately, asking, what should we be learning from the moment? And in many respects, that's what the book is about. So let's start with what we should be learning. And I'd like you to talk about what we should be learning about society generally and the society that we had that was hit by COVID-19. In the book, I use the phrase that we were sitting ducks for COVID-19. And what I mean by that is that we had designed our society to be particularly vulnerable to a virus. And now why is that? Number one, we were a much less healthy society than we could have been long before the pandemic. Americans lived sicker, shorter lives than their peer nations, despite extraordinary expenditure on health. And number two, we had the economic and social circumstances that put some people at unnecessary and unavoidable for them risk of exposure to a novel pathogen. And number three, we had long underinvested in what could have helped us, which is the infrastructure of public health. So those three were elements of our society that made us, to use the term ways in the book, sitting ducks for the ravages of a pandemic. Now, even with that very difficult situation, there's the actual management of the pandemic. There's how we respond to pandemic and what we recognize about our vulnerability and how quickly we're able to put measures in place to save lives. How did you see that unfolding and how did that contribute to the million deaths? Well, let's start with the good part. The good part is the elements of our societal structure that we invested in did phenomenally well. And I think those two elements are our vaccines, right? We developed mRNA vaccines within eight months of the virus really being sequenced, which is extraordinarily fast for vaccines. Normally, it's many years and decades. And the reason for that is because we had spent 20 years investing in this mRNA technology. So that's went very well. Number two, the other thing that we invested in was our hospitals and our health systems. And our hospitals and health systems actually did very well. When you look at the data about death, once people were in hospital, our hospitals adapted remarkably quickly, considering we didn't have vaccines, considering we didn't have treatment. What did not go well was out in society, outside of our hospitals, out in the world, we failed at delivering vaccines in a way that those who are most vulnerable were more likely to get them. We failed at 
protecting people, particularly protecting those who are more vulnerable. And we knew who was most vulnerable really very quickly. By February of 2020, we had the data from the China CDC, so we knew who was most vulnerable. In many respects, the response to COVID was a failure of implementation. And it was a failure of implementation in all the areas which we had underinvested in. And those are the areas of public health, which we have underinvested in for decades. And those are the areas also of investing in stable political and social structures that could make the right decisions and implement things rapidly. And so we saw a failure to do that. We also saw that instead of coming together, the country kind of fell apart in some respects. And, you know, the vitriol expressed towards public health officials being one part of that. How do you see that as contributing to the toll? There's no question one of the stories that's going to be told about COVID is the story of social fracturing. And the question is, why was there social fracturing? And we have to remember, COVID hit the U.S. in March of 2020 during the run-up to U.S. presidential election. It instantly intersected with the political forces that were gearing up. And secondly, COVID was the first national crisis experienced in an age of social media. And this was a medium that had supplanted the public square. And we were learning how to deal with that. And social media, of course, is a very particular form of media that prioritizes the disputatious, the argumentative, the flashy, the adjective. And I think those two things intersected to create this very rapid two sets of competing orthodoxies. And everything in COVID was then seen through this lens, resulting in this, what I'm sorry, using the term social fracturing in the country, splitting in half. And that left no room for nuance and careful argument about how we should deal with COVID. And that had tremendously, tremendously negative consequences. At a superficial level, at an easy level to understand, the manifestation of that was around masking. You know, masking became a symbol of whether or not you, quote, believed in the virus or whether you did not believe in the virus, which is, of course, an absurdly simplistic way of looking at something which actually could have really complex, nuanced debates around it. Now, I think we can give ourselves a pass on this in, say, spring of 2020, when the virus was new and when things were happening quickly. But come summer of 2020, we had gotten a good grip on what we were dealing with. And we as a country should have been much better at having the difficult conversations that would get us to the right place about what to do. And we just simply did not have those because by then we were so divided, we were so fractured that everything that we did became an issue of contention played out through the megaphone of social media and against the backdrop of immensely divisive politics. So we were sitting ducks on top of that. We didn't have the structures to respond on top of that. We were fractured with social media contributing. It's a pretty bleak picture and that's how you get to a million deaths. And now the book is The Contagion Next Time. And the purpose of the book is to draw lessons and wisdom from this difficult experience and think about, you know, what could actually put us in a different position. So talk about that. Yeah. The book is predicated on the premise that the next pandemic is not a matter of if, but when. And there's nothing at all brilliant about saying that. I mean, scientists have been you know, saying for decades and centuries that there will be other pandemics, other pandemics, other pandemics. And and I think we should see this pandemic as part of a long sequence of pandemics that affect the human species. Hopefully, we won't in our lifetime, but one never knows. There could be another pandemic in 2025. And the book really aims to put these ideas that you and I are talking about in the mainstream conversation. My concern about where we're at in the pandemic is that the pandemic, once it passes or once it becomes endemic, once we learn to live with it, there's going to be a lot of reckoning with it. And we're going to say what really helped us was vaccines. So let us just make sure that we invest a lot in rapid detection of zoonotic infections and rapid moving from detection to vaccines. And if we can do that and very quickly, the problem will be solved. And the argument I'm making is the problem will not be solved because fundamentally, unless you deal with these underlying issues that we talked about, unless we deal with the infrastructure to help us resolve it, unless we deal with our ability to communicate, and you, Josh, have written about communication, public health, and how hard that is, even if we get the vaccines quickly, another pandemic will come and it'll still be a tragedy. So the, the central argument of the book is, I would like us to talk about these issues that you and I are talking about to make sure that they are part of the conversation. The fact that the US was sicker and Americans were living shorter lives than our peer nations had nothing to do with COVID, that it preceded COVID by 30 years. Now is the time to say, 
Hmm. We shouldn't accept that. We shouldn't accept for the country that spends most on health compared to any other income country that we live shorter lives. And I think just to make one last quote on that, one of the mistakes that we as a country made before COVID is we may recognize this data point that, look, we have uh, shorter lives than other high-income countries, but there's a sense that that is perhaps brought down by particularly marginalized groups who have particularly poor health. But in fact, the data are very clear that even among the best-performing groups on health, we are still lagging behind other countries because our entire national picture is nowhere near as good as it can be. So now is the time to double down and say, how do we make our health better? It'll certainly save us in the next pandemic, but frankly, it'll do a lot of good between now and then. Now, how to do that? And one of the themes that runs through this book and is you know, certainly present in much of your writing is the importance of equity and understanding that being better prepared, taking care of some of these issues, making progress for everyone really requires paying attention to some of the deep gaps that exist. How do you hope that the country comes to do that? Yeah, you know, equity, you're right, it has been a thread for much of my work. And lately, and perhaps one of the positives of the COVID era is uh, there has been a lot of discussion about equity. I do think that a lot of discussion about equity is superficial, that we toss it around a lot and uh, we don't really pay attention to it. I mean, the argument is as follows. We know that having more assets is linked to better health. Now, I use the word asset intentionally. Asset can be income, it can be wealth, it can be a house, it can be a car, it'll be a safe neighborhood. These are all assets, right? But we know perhaps the most clear empiric observation in all of epidemiology is more assets, better health. So that's step one. Step two, we know that health gaps, meaning some groups having more health than others, is mapped on pretty directly to asset gaps. Now, given that we know that, then you come to the question of how do we narrow health gaps? You can't really narrow health gaps without thinking about how to narrow asset gaps. Now, for example, that thinking has led me to co-author a piece with a good colleague, Dr. Mary Bassett, about making an argument for Black reparations based really from the health argument that we know that Black Americans have worse health than white Americans have so for centuries as a legacy of centuries of disenfranchisement, marginalization coming from slavery. Well, you can't really narrow those gaps without making a serious effort to address the asset gaps that underlie that. And Black reparations could be one way of dealing with that asset gap. So to my mind, if we care about health equity, it cuts through some of the perhaps political and highly emotionally charged issues by making it clear that we need to tend to those. And you know, in, certainly in that paper and in my writing, I'll be very careful. It's not what I do to think about how does one address these issues. So I'll leave that to economists and uh, and uh, political scientists. But it seems to me that our responsibility in public health is to surface this, that we cannot genuinely tackle health equity without also tackling asset inequity. Now, I just want to say one more thing about that, because sometimes when I speak like that, I'm you know, accused of being a socialist or communist. I want to be clear, actually, I'm not. I mean, as an immigrant to this country coming from a socialist country, I haven't seen any other uh, political system or uh, economic system that uh, works better in the long term than some sort of market-driven economy. The question, of course, is the guardrails on that. And I think we're at a moment where even the people who are post their children for, let's say, capitalists, like heads of banks, are saying that we are in a place of inequities which are unsustainable. And I think that is an important moment for us as a world. And will COVID surface these issues once and for all? I hope so. And whether it does and whether we respond may have a lot to do with the contagion next time. It may. Well, and I'm hoping it has something to do with this contagion, of course. And, you know, the more I live in public health, as you do, Josh, the more I feel like the, perhaps the most important thing we can do in public health is shifting the conversation on health and shifting how people think about health. And I feel like that's what one does in these conversations that are part of your podcast, so that there is a greater appreciation of the fact that there can be no health without stable housing, safe neighborhoods, livable wages, gender equity. Like, like these are inextricably linked with health. Well, Dr. Galea, this has been terrific to uh, talk about. You have taken a number, one million deaths, and put a framework around it that allows us to understand and to think about solutions. So thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Niall Owen-McCusker, Matthew Martin, 
Spencer Greer, and Holly Cardinal, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez. Thank you for listening. Thank you.